Good afternoon. Hi, Salam Alaikum. I'd like to certainly thank Dr. Johnson and the uh, National Association of Conscious Black Women for having the courage to invite me here. I think that most of you have heard, read, or seen something about my book around the country. I've been on a national tour for 12 months, and uh, I'm doing the lecture tour to reach a lot of our people who uh, perhaps got the wrong understanding from television. Television shows are designed in a certain way by the producers of those shows to exploit whatever the uh, idea is that's being presented so as to get high ratings. And so they have kind of had me back against the wall, and so I'm doing the lecture tour so that I could go around and perhaps give our people a little relief because so many things have been taken out of context and it has created a lot of confusion. My position is that the black woman's disrespect and rebellion against the leadership and the authority of the black man is the direct cause of the breakdown in our black family structure. Now, of course, there are many black people who consider those fighting words because as black women, we have never been subject to the kind of examination uh, that our men have been subject to since we have been here. We have been somewhat protected and shielded from any kind of critiquing about our personal behavior whereas our men have always been up for examination. Um, the book is not an attack on black women. I have never said that all black women do everything that I list in my book. Uh, none of us have lived long enough to do everything that I list in the book, but uh, most of us do some of the things that I've listed in my book. And I do say that it is not because of generalizations that we are all victimized by some of the negative patterns of behavior in the book, but the book just represents our collective contribution. This is some of everything that we have done or that we do daily that contributes to the breakup of our relationship, the destruction of our man, and the failure of our children to be able to function. They did not tell us that all of that, uh, being my own person and I'm independent, would lead to separation, loneliness, celibacy, and lesbianism. They didn't tell us that if you give up the man, you're going to take one of these things and it's worse and it will destroy your nation. They didn't give us that information. They made us think that it was some kind of glorified position to brag about the fact that I got my own job, my own credit card, my own car, so I don't need no man. I don't even know how we got that mixed up. Ain't none of that got nothing to do with having being with no man. <laughs> you, know, you know, we have some serious relationship problems that uh, nobody has been able to address us on because everybody wants to pretend that this is not going on. You know, over 60% of our women are single, widowed, separated, or divorced. They don't have a man. I just came out of Florida and they got a housing complex that the Urban League built, which is a black organization that is for women and children only. They, don't, they say they don't allow any men in there. I didn't have time to deal with it, but I talked about them real bad. That's the silliest program I've ever heard of. You know the women that had men if they got a bunch of children. They need fathers. They need protection. We hear about the drug problem that we have in our projects across the country. It's one of the major places that we have a drug problem. You know, we talk about the great strength that we have as black women. Well, the uh, welfare department don't rent government apartments to single black men. Those apartments belong to black women who are allowing this to go on in their home. We have not looked at what part of the responsibility do we share. Yes, black men sell a lot of drugs, and a lot of us black women get the money from them drugs and buy some of these fancy clothes we wear, drive around in some of these fancy cars. He is not doing these things alone and without support from us, whether they are good or bad. See, we have a lot of power. We are very strong women. I'm saying that we're using our strength in the wrong direction. We're using it to tear our man down, tear our nation down, instead of building it up. Having an education and a job is not, does not necessarily mean you have a successful life. I keep telling black women that to uh, raise a child, they say, well, I uh, provided with food, clothing, and shelter. That's not raising a child, that's maintaining one. To raise a child, you need a parental coalition of a man and a woman. We have sons who, are, by not having a father in the home, they don't know how to respect women. They take on the uh, black feminine, female emotionalism, emotionalism. They become bitchy, they're doubtful, they're indecisive, they can't make a decision. They don't know what to do about being a man because we can't teach them that. We don't have that knowledge. 
We have daughters who grew up in a home where they don't see any affection, where there's no man there. They go out into the world and try to mate. They don't have no idea how to be no woman to no man, how to ma function in a house with a man, because they haven't seen it. Most of our children, just like us, get all the information we have about how you be with a mate off television. It's the only medium that shows us anybody being together. Those rules have not worked for us. The white woman's liberation movement, we don't have anything to do with that. We have not been under the control of the black man for over 500 years, so what do we have to get liberated from them from? <laughs> they haven't been our boss. That's the white woman and her man. They're going through that, and that's their business. We don't have any business being in that. They only introduced it to break down the civil rights movement. Civil rights movement started with the black man, the black woman, and the black child standing together, trying to plead for a freedom, justice, and equality, and more benefits in the country that they had had built. They threw the white woman in there with the women's liberation movement and made it a woman against man thing. That created a big separation between black men and black women because then everybody started going for self. Then they bring the welfare system in and tell us in order to feed and clothe and house our children, we have to give up our man. You have to put the man out of the house. When the white farm wife goes to the government for subsidy for the farm, they don't tell her to get rid of the farm and they keep that family together. But in the black community, they make it a requirement because they want to keep endorsing into the black community that the black man is no good and that he is not deserving of respect, he is not deserving of us letting him give us any protection or instruction and that we are better than them. The major responsibility that the black woman has had on the earth for the over, uh, the trillions of years that we have been here has been one of nutrition and birthing children. Those two things have a great deal to do with the survival of any people, the reproduction of the nation and feeding them the proper food so that they can live. Those are very important jobs. Those are very powerful positions because it puts us in a position to decide who's going to live or die and how slow they're going to die by what we feed them. We have a very powerful position. That's, that's not a, a small role that we play. We have just been taught to misrepresent and misuse that power. The, the people who we have been counting on to give us the truth about how to get along uh, have failed. The white people don't know how to get along. They don't have that information themselves. They don't get along with nobody on earth. So they didn't have no information to impart to us about how we're supposed to get along. They changed their relationship rules at will. We have, you know, tons of black children around this country that I hear from who will have grown up traumatized by the fact that they were referred to as the outside child. You know, when we were having children like that, they called it illegitimate children until the white woman started having them and now it's single parenting. See, they change the rules according to what they're doing. So I've called on our people to change them depending on what we want to do, what our needs are. There's another need that has not been addressed in our community, no, because nobody will deal with it, and that's one that God did not create three sexes. We only have men and women. Now, I have not said that we should reject the sisters who try and act like men and the men who try and act like women. I'm not saying to reject them from among us, but they need to be taught. We don't have to accept that as some kind of normalcy because that's not normal. But because now the white people are practicing that, you know, when we were doing it, we were punks and faggots. Now that they're doing it, now it's an alternative lifestyle. <laughs> demonstrate how they have set rules that they have forced us to follow that they don't even follow themselves. They change the rules to suit them when they get ready. We can change them to suit us when we get ready, especially if we have what we have now, which is a failing system. It hasn't worked for us. We don't have to be ashamed that it hasn't worked for us. But we do have to be ashamed of the fact that we keep plodding behind it and not trying to make the corrections that will help our people to survive. So I have to start saying that
people that the more education we get, the more people we get in front of our name. I have charged that our educational class has failed us. They have not represented our needs. All they got was a job. I gave them 30 years to present us with a program, a national project, an agenda that we could work on to improve our homes, and it never did arrive. The only thing they gave us was a welfare program, and we know that that failed. The reason that I wrote the book, certainly, which is a classic question that I'm asked all over the country, I wrote the book because we represent the missing link as black women. The black uh, man has been dissected, examined, the white man, the white woman, and the black child. But it has been us as black women who have never been examined. We have been protected, we have been insulated, we have been kept from any kind of criticism about our personal behavior in the home and outside of the home. And we have been given the false compliment that we are the backbone of the black nation. There is no doubt in any community in this country that the men in those communities are the backbone of their nations. There is no doubt in the white community that the white man is the backbone of his nation. The European, the Buddhist, the Korean, the Japanese, the Hispanic, all of those men are the backbones of their community and there's no doubt about it. It is only in the black community where those values have been transposed and where they put that burden on us and tell us that we are the backbone of the black community, which is a direct insult to the black man and implies that he don't have no backbone and that his women have to represent him. It's a heavy burden. It's one we are tired of carrying, and it is one that is not true. I remind people all the time that God did not make the white man, the white woman, the black woman, and then the black man. He made the black man first, and he created all of the rest of the people after him. When I wrote my first book back in 1985, I was going about the country trying to still work to teach our people something, trying to get them to stop eating pork. And uh, at that time, I was having what I call get off those hog lectures. And, uh, I would take the microscope out and I would show black people how even if you cook pork, you couldn't kill the worm. I would show them that uh, the worm was still alive in the meat after heat because that's what they told us, that you could cook it and kill the worm. And so I would show them what it did to the brain and the spinal column. And so there were many black men who wanted to stop eating pork. They wanted to change their diets and uh, they were in agreement. But it was the black woman who I found who was the most adamant who refused to change her cooking habits, who didn't want to shop differently, who didn't want to do any different meal planning. And so I say, well now, if we are refusing to provide the black man with the proper physical food when we know food is what sustains life, then what else are we keeping from him? What else are we doing to destroy our men, to destroy our families, because we don't know any better or because we're too lazy or because nobody has ever called on us to repent? And so then that led me to the study 
And so as I was going along, initially I was keeping up with names and addresses and all of those things for that so-called uh, research that they talk about. And then I found out that we didn't have a control group. There was not one set of Negroes that I could point at and say, well, these particular Negroes over here, they didn't suffer from the psychological trauma of slavery, so we don't have to deal with that. I found out that all of us had the same problems and that we were not as different as we think we are. We are all doing the same things. We're all practicing the same patterns of behavior. A pattern is something that people follow because they think it's the right way to go. We have been doing it and approving that behavior between each other because we think, well, this is just how you do it. We have not represented our own ideas. We have not had anyone to represent our own ideas to us. The only place we have learned about how to be a woman or how a man is to be a man is on television. We haven't had that kind of a chance to study ourselves. The white woman has been the only woman we have had an opportunity to study every day of our life, on television, in every magazine we ever picked up, in every newspaper, on every radio. She's been the only model we have had. And if we think that that's not important, then we need to, you know, look at that again. We have studied that and we have made up and came up with requirements that the white people have set for us for our man. And if he cannot come up to those requirements, then we have decided that he is impotent and unable to be our man because he's disqualified, because he does not qualify by the standards that the white people have set up. We think a good successful relationship is one where everything goes our way. The first time it stops going our way, then we got a serious problem. We want our man to do everything we tell him to do, but we don't want to do anything he tells us to do. Yeah, it's hard language. And all of our so-called educated class together have never come up with an agenda that brought the people together to try to improve their condition like the black man's guy. Not a one of them have ever had a program that got all of the black people talking, got all of them out made everybody decide to make a comment whether they wanted to or not. People are compelled to testify all over the country. I can't walk the street. <laughs> See, we, we've never been examined, as I said. In the, the breakdown of every relationship, each party in the relationship shares one half the responsibility. That's 50% of the responsibility. So yes, the black man is 50% responsible for the breakdown of our relationships. And we are the other 50% half responsible for the breakdown of our relationships. And I ask black women, if you do not want to accept 50% of the responsibility, what percentage do you accept and how does that behavior manifest? And I guarantee you it's already in my book. Because this lists the things that we do. We've just never seen it in print. We've never had it out front. We've never been busted, but now we have the equality we've been crying for. They're busted and so are we. I teach that slavery tampered with nature. When I say that slavery tampered with nature, I mean that a major rite of passage for every male mammal is to provide and protect for a female and her young. Now certainly we know that the black man has been denied that opportunity. He has not been allowed to qualify to protect his woman or provide from them, for them. They have told us that the only provision that the black man is qualified to give us is one of money. And we have made finance the major uh, focus of our relationships with them. We have made the one thing that most of them don't even have be the criteria. We have been taught that if they do not give us money, that we are not to even allow them to be a father to their child. We have been taught that if he does not give us money, then he is not qualified to tell us what to do. We have been taught that if he does not give us money, that he doesn't have any rights in the home. It's whoever is making the money who has the rights. That's not our system. The black man provides more in a black home than just financial support. He provides direction, guidance, gratification, fulfillment, and discipline for our children. Those are the principles that are missing in our home today, which is why our children are savage in the streets. 
We see those children out there sometimes acting wild and uncivilized and disrespectful because they don't respect anyone because we didn't teach them any respect. We didn't know how. And a lot of times we look at them and we say, yeah, they're out there doing this, and we act like that they drop down out of the sky. But those are our children. We birthed them up out of our womb. They belong to us. And we are responsible for them. And for every child that's out there out of control, disrespectful, ignorant, and uneducated, they have a black mother somewhere who failed to do her job and a black father who failed to do his. It is not the responsibility it is not the responsibility of the American government to raise our children. It is not the responsibility of the American government to support our women. And it certainly is not the responsibility of the American government to hold our man down. This book is to allow us to have a new chance to start all over and say, yes, this is what has happened. I didn't make myself like this. We don't get anything from ourselves. We pick it all up externally. And as we have picked up these bad habits, we can, you know, decide that we are not going to do them. See, what has happened is that we have been turned sisters into kind of like Frankenstein. I think everybody remembers the Frankenstein monster. He had somebody's arms, uh, somebody's legs. He even had somebody else's brain inside of his skull. Oh, he was functional, but he was not himself. And so, yes, we are functional. We have been taught that having a good job means that we are a total success. We have been taught that the solution to all the problems of the black people in America is to get a job with the white people. That's just not the truth. And that's certainly not saying that it is not important for us to have money for food, clothing, and shelter. And it's not saying that we as black women are not strong. I'm here today to represent some of that monumental strength we say we have. That, this does not mean that we are not strong. We don't have to put our man down in order to be strong. I'm just saying that we have used our strength in the wrong direction. We've been using it against our man instead of for him. If we use the kind of strength and influence that we have in this society to support the black man, won't anybody be able to come against him? But every man is judged by his woman, and if his woman say he ain't nothing, then the whole world believes he ain't nothing. The actual fact is every man himself judge him, his own self by his woman. He can be out in the world being great and the whole world can be kneeling to him and if he come home and she say, you ain't nothing, you ain't been nothing, then that's who he believes. And yes, we have insulted our man in front of our children. It wasn't intentional. We just been frustrated. We couldn't make you brothers do what we want you to do. We didn't have anybody else to tell sometimes. So we would say it over the children. He ain't no good. He make me sick. He's stupid. If he loved you, he would be here with you. When every man in here know that his relationship with his children is predicated on his relationship with their mother, and if they are not getting along with us, they are not going to spend any time with the children. That's just how that is. And I've talked to brothers around this country, and I have testimonies and tons of men, letters from brothers, who write and tell me that my book made them to decide to try to be a man again and try to have a woman. Now, if you think that's not an important work, I got black men who write me and say, you have made me decide not to have another white woman. I'm going to try to get back with the sisters and try them one more time. <laughs> See, you know, nobody is going to give us this information. Uh, they, they have us standing around sometime and pointing at the brothers and saying, yeah, that's them over there. They ain't no good. They doing this and that and the other, and it's all negative. And they have us thinking that the black man is going to die and we're going to live on. But that's not how it's going to go. There is still one monolith in the black community, and that's that it still takes a man and a woman to make a baby. So if the black man dies, we all die. And I don't want to die. I want to live. I want my children and my grandchildren and whatever else is coming after Sharon's out, I want that to live. But we are not on the path of life. We're on the path of destruction. You know, learning how to, to get along has to be taught by force. Slavery was taught by force. We didn't volunteer for that. They made us do that. They forced us to do that. And that's how we're going to have to learn how to reunify. It's going to have to be done by force. We're going to have to make ourselves try to deal with each other. 
Yeah, and, and that's very difficult, and it certainly takes a great deal of self-control and love for your nation at large. It's the greatest form of unselfishness. Now, I don't go around advocating that people that hate each other stay together. That's not what I'm saying. That's different. We can't solve a problem or get to a solution about a problem that we refuse to acknowledge that we have. We don't have to be ashamed that we have a problem. We don't have to be ashamed to know that it is related to slavery because all of our problems are related to slavery. And I know that that seems to be some old hat issue and, and everybody want me to stop talking about that. Uh, nobody would tell the Japanese woman to forget about the fact that during World War II, the white man interned her family took all of their personal possessions. Nobody would tell her to forget about that. Uh, nobody would tell the Indian woman, forget about the fact that the white man came over here and took your country and put you and your babies out on the reservation. And nobody would dare to tell the Jewish woman to forget about the Holocaust, so why I gotta forget about slavery? See, the Japanese and the Indian and the Jewish woman got behind their men, and they had some very terrible histories also. But because they got behind their men and supported them and worked with them, those people are successful today. They own property. They have businesses. They got great land here and abroad. You know, they have stocks, bonds, whatever America has to offer. They own part of that. They are in a position to make decisions because they have some ownership. It's only been the black man and the black woman who didn't reunite after a terrible time. And so today we are splintered. We don't have very much. We practice envy and jealousy. You know, they taught us a lot of bad habits that we practice against each other. If we practice everything we practice against each other, against the white man, they'd have been killed out of America. <laughs> Most of that stuff we reserve for our own kind. And that's wrong. We have uh, had that rumor that we, we are the backbone of the black nation because it has served to make us think we were better than the black man. We have walked around and, and wore that as some kind of a sacred garment. And our men have had to struggle up under the already preconceived notion that they wasn't no good. We have always heard that the black man leaves us. He walks out on us. He don't love his children. He won't take care of his family. He beat his women. He do a lot of horrible things. This book goes back to try to examine what are some of the possible contributing causes. What happened before he left? What happened? Something happened. The black man is just not bad by nature. The brothers love their children as much as any other man. Every man loves his baby. They keep wanting to tell us that our man don't even love his children. He's not a mother, though. He's a father. He's not going to have the same kind of connection to the cub that we have. We can't expect that. We keep wanting the man to act like a woman. He can't act like no woman, praise be to Allah. <laughs> I wrote the book so that the brothers would understand what's going on because most of what we charge them with is that he can't quote handle us. He can't handle me. They haven't known what they were handling. They didn't have that information. The book is really a book that puts the black man on point because it tells him what he has allowed to happen to his woman and his children. And he can never again say he didn't know what was going on because I have told him. <laughs> See, it's never been an issue about whether or not the book is true or not, brother. The issue has been that I was not supposed to tell. But that's the missing information. And I was willing to come out here and go through whatever was going to be required if it was going to reunite some of our people. If we can get one or two black families in every town to start functioning differently, to make a better man and a better woman, then this campaign is worth it. It's worth it for our entire nation. I didn't just donate money to Marva Collins School because this is my hometown or because I wanted to put it in my mother's name. But we must have our own black schools to educate our own children. We have to educate our own children. If it's in a closet, I would rather support them 
have my own kind, trying to teach my own kind, than sending them out there into the white people's school and let them tell them all kind of nonsense that they want to. It's a very serious situation. Uh, let us take a look at what we as black women have produced while we were allegedly backboning the black nation. One in every four black males between the age of 20 and 29 is in prison, on parole, been arrested, or had some bump with the law. Over 50% of our prison population is black, male, growing, and female. We have more black men in prison than in college. Six out of every 10 black men between the ages of 15 and 44 are unemployed, in jail, got some disease, homosexual, on drugs. 73% of all the black men in prison were raised by a single black woman in a home with no man. 80% of that 73% suffered child abuse in the home, victimized by the mother. One third of our children drop out of school before they graduate. Over 60% of our households are headed by black women who are single, divorced, separated, or widowed. Yeah, we got a serious problem. And only God knows how many of our black babies we have killed through abortion. I don't think that's something the black, I think that's something the black man will never understand how we kill that life in our womb because we decide we don't feel like taking care of it. It's too much of a hassle. Or we change our mind about how we feel about the man. So we have been in a very, very powerful position. We can make heaven or hell for the man and we can decide who's gonna live and die. That is a great woman, I agree. But we are in a very prestigious position. We are the wives of the man who was the first man that God chose to be on the earth. That's a very great position. The most valued and the strongest man on the earth that everybody's trying to use for something. He's the most durable. He's the most persistent. He's the most determined. The black man is not wrong because he does not do what white America wants him to do. And he's not wrong because he don't do what we want him to do. We don't know everything to do ourselves. We're learning a lot of what we think that we're supposed to do through recommendation and chance. Passing information among each other. Sharing secrets that'll help us to trick him, to keep him confused. We do things in front of his face and we have learned how to convince him that he didn't even see that happen. Just serious situations. This is the first platform black man has ever had to air his grievances about the black woman because nobody would ever listen to him. They listen to us. And we have had many complaints. Many of them may be true, but they have complaints against us too. They've just been too cool to deal with it like that. And then God sent Sister Sharaza and said, we're going to deal with it now. History can't be complete without dealing with it. We cannot let the history live and die and record that we were all right and they were all wrong because that's just not the way it is. We are good people, but we are, go are both going to be a good people. And I hear, you know, women around the country tell me, say, well, you have insulted black womanhood and now anybody from any foreign country or anybody who picks your book up is going to think that all black women are like that. That's impossible. Everything I list in the book is visual and audible. You can see it or you can hear it. So if you don't see it or hear it, it ain't there. But if you see it and hear it, which you will, it, it's present. So there's no danger that somebody's going to look at one of us and think we are doing the things that I describe in the book. Because you can see if somebody's doing that or not. That, that's, that's not difficult to be able to read a person on that. The book certainly does not give the black man any rights over us in a certain kind of a way because no man can begin to try to get us together until he look at himself in the book. See, we represent problem number two. They already know who problem number one is. Now, I know that many of us uh, have heard a lot about, allegedly, as I said, about how much money I'm supposed to be making. I have to mention that because that's what they mention in all of the newspapers around the country. It's, it's the weirdest thing I ever heard of. Uh, one article in Emerge Magazine before I left, the day before yesterday, I come out of Boston, I went back through Philadelphia and, and somebody had faxed me a copy of an article out of uh, Emerge Magazine. And the magazine said that they were still getting letters about my book. 
but that they had decided not to print anything else about it because they had decided that my book had made enough money. <laughs> so I called the editors up. I, say, I told my secretary, I said, get him on the telephone. So I asked him, I said, uh, uh, that was a very ridiculous and ignorant remark to make, brother, since you don't know what the book sells for or how many I've sold or any of that. I say, plus, why don't some of you black people get together and go tell IBM and Adidas and Nike and Reebok that they made enough money? Those are the people robbing our people. I said, go down there and tell Xerox they made enough money and see what they say. I have security. Uh, mostly, not because of black women. We ain't gonna do nothing but fuss. You know, I have security because of black men. The book puts the black man on point. They get hysterical, they go into denial, they jump the seats, charge down the aisles, you'd be surprised. <laughs> so it's not the black woman that this book is upset because many of our black men don't want to take responsibility for their families. Many of them, uh, not just because of financial reasons, many of them have accepted so much of the hype in the medias that they, they don't know what it would be like to be in charge. They got doubt. They have fear. They are afraid that they will fail. We are all afraid of failure. The major tool that was used against us during slavery was the uh, uh, implication of fear. We have to get past that fear. Our men have to stop being scared to say, yes, I'm the head of the house. They need to know that every woman want to know her limitations with her man. Any woman that can do a man any kind of way and have her way with him and say anything she want to him, she ain't going to want him in a minute. We have to know what the black line is. I had a, uh, uh, did an interview the other day from a newspaper out of uh, Baltimore. Anyway, so they had brought down the camera crew and stuff, and so they were trying to interview me. So, of course, they got on that favorite part of the book, you know, that everybody deal with. And so uh, he asked me, had a, I, I haven't been slapped in the mouth. <laughs> so, so I told him, I say, well, uh, this book is not an autobiography, first of all. I said, and uh, secondly, I said, I don't get that far out of control. I say, since that's how it's described, it's very easy to keep that from happening. Just don't do that. So I said, I don't do that. I don't talk like that. I said, I can tell by his tone of voice when it's time to stop talking. <laughs> yeah. That, that, that's the most amazing thing. The amazing thing to me is how our people go around the country trying to pretend that we ain't fight. <laughs> and that I made that up. You know. <laughs> but, uh, as I said, this book demonstrates that, that we are not as different as we like to think that we are. So what I'm going to go over real brief right now is what the attributes are of the good black woman. Since she's not on television, we may not recognize her. Okay. Now, the good black woman has seven attributes, and then I'm going to explain to you how to utilize those in your day-to-day -day life. A good black woman has self-discipline, courteousness, cheerfulness, self-respect, intelligence, cleanliness, and love. Now, we've heard those, that terminology. You know, it's like one of those where they tell you, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. What do that mean? You know, how, how can I make that functional in my day-to-day -day life to benefit me as a practice? It sounds like all theory. Where is the practicum? What do I do? The good black woman has self-discipline. That's self-control. Let me make that real for you, sisters. We can start with our mouth. The good black woman can control her mouth. She don't have to say everything that comes up. It's okay if he get the last word sometime. You know. She don't cuss in public. And she works on not cussing in private. She don't tear a man down with her mouth because they can't out-argue us. Can't nobody out-argue us. I have charged that we nag our men too much. We keep our men's head tied up so much with our petty grievances about our personal relationship that he don't have time to think and plan for our future. Because he got to deal with what's going to happen with us every day. You know, it's, it's real live. When the black man 
come home, he almost had to do a wind test or stick his toe in the door. He don't know what's waiting. He don't know who in there today. He know it's a possibility that there's some kind of new monster that he didn't even know about yesterday. <laughs> so, you know, we, we need to not make it like that. We need to not be so vicious with our mouth. You know, men are not petty like that. They're not going to out-argue us. And it has been proven that verbal abuse is just as harmful as physical abuse. So let's not use our mouth to do that to him. The good black woman is courteous. She says, thank you, baby. I appreciate you doing that. I appreciate every effort you make. Try harder. I'm going to work with you. Thank you. I know you did your best. Now that's a whole new language. <laughs> but just to say that during the course of the day every day with the man that you're trying to be with or want to be with will make our life easier. We can't get it if we don't give it. We keep wanting them to give us and do something for us that we refuse to do and give to them. It don't work like that. The good black woman has self-respect. She don't have to go out naked just to get the attention of a man. I have sisters all over the country and they, and they come up to me uh, after the lectures and they'll be talking to me and they'll say, well, you know, uh, all he think about is sex. All he think about is my body. I say, why don't you show him something else? <laughs> and then here's the really good one. They'll come up and they'll have on uh, uh, a weave. They have on false eyelashes, another whole face, false fingernails, and all of that. And then they'll say, but I'm looking for a real man. can pull a dress down without thinking that it devalues her. She doesn't have to use her body because she has so many other good attributes about herself to get the attention of a man. We can take the sisters, the sisters in a position to take all of the charge uh, and sexual energy out of the black community by just dressing differently. We have the power and control over that. That don't stop you from being beautiful. That don't stop you from getting a man. And it certainly puts things on the right perspective so some other judgments can be made other than physical. Don't take no knowledge, wisdom, and understanding to have a sexual reaction. That's the most base. We spend less time doing that than anything else we do. So, you know, that doesn't always have to be the forefront issue. We know we are capable of that. The good black woman has intelligence meaning that she knows how to behave properly in the streets. She's not in the wrong place. Some of our women don't know what else to do other than go to the bar. They need some activities. Some of our women thinking that staying home on the weekend is some kind of sin. Some of our women think that if they don't have a new outfit to wear every day that they gonna self-destruct. You know, we, we have a lot of just that kind of nonsense going. Uh, every time we buy new outfits and clothes or whatever, all we're doing is sending money out of our community. We don't own no clothing stores. If the white man closed the shoe factory, we'd all be here barefooted tonight. We don't own no shoe factories. You know, very base things that we don't own that we put our money into and demand we have to have them. A lot of times our men look at us and know that he ain't never gonna be able to make enough money to give us all of the things we say we want. And don't no man want to be with no woman who he constantly got to deny her the things that she says she wants. Right. And that represents failure to him, to have to always, you know, not be able to provide us with what we ask for. One of the ways we can do that is to start being satisfied with less. You know, the good black woman is clean. Now, that's a hard one. The good black woman tried to keep the house clean. Good black woman is clean by her own body. You know, a lot of those things we kind of take for granted, but all of our people don't know about that. 
There are people who are angry with me because I even described the fact that some of us as sisters uh, don't have the proper personal hygiene as if that don't exist. We have too much falsehood and pretense going about our condition. Everybody that's dressed up ain't clean. You know, that's just the truth. We have to look at our condition in the light of truth. Stop reacting emotionally and pretending that just because we don't want to deal, one of the most difficult things that I deal with out here is trying to teach our people the difference between an actual fact and an opinion. Our people think that they can accept or reject truth based on how they feel about it. Your feelings don't change the truth. The truth is just going to be there. You can feel any kind of way you want to feel about it. Those are just, those kind of emotions have kept us from growing. Because anything we don't like, we just reject that and say, well, I don't believe that. That don't mean that it's not the truth. It just makes you a disbeliever. <laughs> the good black woman uh, practices non-possessive loving. Now, y'all know that's a hard one. <laughs> now, envy is wanting what someone else has. And jealousy, of course, is just selfishness. Uh, non-possessive loving is not an easy one for us to practice. And, uh, of course, I have a lot of sisters and some brothers who are in disagreement with me saying that. But the actual fact is that our men are outnumbered about five to one. And nature is going to require that the men take responsibility for more than one woman and her children. Most of our men have children by more than one woman anyway. So I don't know why that was such a surprise, allegedly, when I said that. The black man has not been waiting on me to tell him he could have more than one woman. You know, I'm in agreement with the rest of y'all. I don't think he should do that, but I fail like you did. There are some things perhaps about the nature of our man that we have been given some definitions about that are not true. There are some things he can do that we call him a dog. We do not have the same capabilities as a man. I am not talking about fornication and adultery. That's something else. I'm talking about actual responsibility of fatherhood and husbandhood of another family. That's quite different from fornication and adultery. We don't have the same capabilities of them. That's right, a man can have two homes, two sets of in-laws, he can eat dinner at two houses, two sets of children, two garages, two separate sets of friends attached to that woman. He can have all of that. We can't do that. We can't cook dinner at two houses. We can't sleep with one man four nights a week and another one three. Ain't no man gonna agree with that. We can't have one set of children we leave in one place and go and stay in another place and take care of another set. It doesn't work for us. Now, that does not mean that we can't have sex with more than one man. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about just taking responsibility for your children. Now, certainly every man can't take financial responsibility for all of his children. He can do something. But a man who is spending time with a child is going to do something for it. Because then they'll find out what we have since we've been taking care of them by ourselves. You don't like to always say, no, I can't do it. No, I ain't got it. So they, the children will make you get it up. You spend some time with it. You know, th that, that's an important thing. Uh, the effectiveness of the principles that I just described, their usefulness has not diminished just because modern opinion has changed about them. There is not a black man in this room who does not still enjoy it if his woman bake him a cake. While our young daughters are being raised and taught that that's old style and that's out of fashion. We are not making those rules, somebody else is, and they're imposing them on us and making us think that we have to qualify under them. I tell the brothers, just like I tell the sisters, if you have a woman that you've been working with for months or years, and uh, you can't get that woman to get in agreement with your program, then get rid of her and get another one. And I tell the sisters the same thing. If you're with a man you can't agree with, don't make his life miserable. Get with a man you can agree with. But we spend too much time living in hell with each other. 
We spend too much time tearing each other down, trying to make the other person do different or function different. If you want somebody to change, first change yourself. We set the example. We are the teacher. We are the mother. 